happy to be here today. Again, my name is Joy. This is Loyola. And my um, synodical authorized call is to Rosecrans Jackson Center as a certified prevention specialist. And I feel very grateful that my synod recognizes what I do um, as a prevention specialist as my call. So that means I'm rostered, um, but I don't have to deal with church councils. <laughs> I don't have to deal with all that stuff. I can do pulpit supply. But my work is as a prevention specialist. And so, Essentially, um, what my goal, and you guys maybe have heard me say this, my goal is to teach the necessity for treatment out of business, right? Uh, our goal would be to educate people so that they no longer end up with a substance use disorder. Because, right, nobody says, I wish I were addicted to something. And yet it happens through a variety of choices and a variety of circumstances. So... We're going to be talking about Matthew 25 kind of as the encompassing of how this works. So just who can tell me something about Matthew 25? Excellent. It's in the Bible. Well done. <laughs> He's a pastor. Okay. <laughs> what else? <laughs> so the, okay. Let's see more, say more about that. The more specificity. Okay, right? And and Jesus is very, very particular about who we are supposed to be engaging, right? Who are we supposed to be engaging? Um, all the uh, bright, wealthy, happy, well-to-do, uh, privileged people? Everybody. Everybody, right? Children. Right? Widows. Poor. Poor. Widows. The imprisoned, right? Um, the sick, the naked, the thirsty, the hungry, right? In other words, yeah, the privileged people are welcome there, but that's not necessarily the, where we stop, right? And so when we're talking then about prevention, it's helpful to understand, right, that prevention um, encompasses, sorry, okay, why can't I move forward here? Oh, I know why. Because my little screen thing is covered up. That prevention is, again, um, purposed to prevent something from happening, happening before it occurs. So this is just me. Um, uh, my I, The numbers after my name or the letters after my name are certified prevention specialist. I'm also an international gaming disorder certified specialist. Um, gaming disorder is kind of a growing edge of addiction and it's called a process addiction. So for example, when we're dealing with people that have gaming disorder, we can't ever expect them to never pick up a device again. Um, like food disorders, shopping disorders, um, sex disorders, we need to help them integrate their use into a healthy life. So it's a bit of a different um, method of prevention, but sort of along the same thing. So, so what I'm gonna ask you guys to do for me for a second, is to, uh, if you have your phone with you, to go to um, menti.com, which you can see on the screen there, and then enter that code. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna gather some data from you. So menti, M-E-N-T-I.com, you don't have to download anything, it'll just show up on your phone. And then enter the code 5518-525-7. Five two five seven, and you should see this image in front of you. And the question I'm asking, sure, it's five five one eight five two five seven. Showing up there, okay. So then, the question I'm asking you is, what is addiction? How do you perceive addiction? Is it a character flaw? Is it a rite of passage? a moral failing, a medical condition, an obsession. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm guessing you all have a clue on this, but let's just see what you choose. Pardon me? <laughs> yeah, right? For your adolescent. <laughs> Ooh, it's nice and slow moving. All right. So what's cool about you guys on virtual, you also can participate in this. See, it's bringing all everybody all together. All of us. I love this. Right? <laughs> You're a bunch of blue dots. So it looks to me as though you both all pretty much understand, right, that addiction is in fact a medical condition. Um, 
there's that's not generally how the public understands addiction, right? They often will see it as a character flaw, as a moral failing of some sort. Um, why can't those people just stop, right? Um, one of our goals, right, in, in prevention is education and helping people understand that if we don't shame people with cancer, we don't shame people with diabetes, we don't shame people with Alzheimer's, don't shame people with multiple sclerosis, we also should not shame people with addiction because it is in fact a disease like other diseases. So this is our definition of disease, right? Um, a condition with a recognizable set of symptoms, course of progression and identified best practices for treatment, right? And we know that this is where addiction fits. Now with a lot of diseases like heart disease, for example, there's a lot of ways that we understand um, that can prevent heart disease, right? So, you know, a healthy diet, exercise, um, and yet even if there are ways we can prevent heart disease, there's also a genetic component, right? If there's heart disease in your family, you are more likely to have heart disease yourself. Understanding addiction in this format, right, is also understanding there are things we can do to prevent it. However, there is a genetic component. So if there is addiction in your family, you have a greater risk of having an addiction in your life as well. And when I'm talking to adolescents in particular, I just encourage them to ask the question, is there addiction in our family? Now, what happens when addiction is associated with shame? Is that that's something we don't talk about, right? We don't talk about that. First sermon I ever did right out of seminary was for a man who committed suicide at my church. And he spent an hour before he killed himself at my desk planning his funeral for me because he thought that would be helpful. So being just out of seminary, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to talk about suicide. I didn't get that, right? I just said, man, this, this guy died of depression by way of suicide. And it was really interesting because after that service, five, five families, elderly couples came up to me and said, we were told we should never talk about the person that we love that committed suicide. It was shoved down deep, caused pain, caused harm. One of the things we talk about in preventing addiction is getting it into the light, right? So that people have all the tools in their tool belt they can to be able to then do best practices to prevent suicide, recognizing they might have a biological risk. We know addiction also, right, is a disease. It is a chronic disease, right? Once somebody has uh, addiction, it is their new normal in which they live in recovery. And we understand it as a disease of the brain. Now so that should give us pause, right? <laughs> hmm, that sounds like it's an important thing to know. So one of the reasons that we spend a lot of time talking to adolescents, of course, about prevention is because their brains aren't finished yet and their brains are vulnerable to any kind of risks that they add to their brains. So um, the chemistry of the brain is actually affected, right? So every time somebody uses to impairment, they change the chemistry of the brain so that the next time they need, they use, they need more to have the same effect. We call this, anybody know what we call that? Increasing tolerance, right? Now I always say, you know, tolerance when we're trying to be tolerant of our neighbors, that's really a low bar, right? Tolerance means I don't want to kill my neighbor, right? <laughs> I'm going to allow you to live. Tolerance for our brain health is a much bigger deal, right? Because every time we use to impairment, not using to get falling down drunk, using to impairment, we change the chemistry of our brain. And that becomes that brain's new normal. Addiction, as you know, is not a choice. Once you have an addiction, your brain is changed and it lives in the prefrontal cortex. It's your decision maker. It's your primary relationship. So helping uh, youth, adolescents to recognize that gives them more tools to make some choices. And again, addiction isn't curable, but it is treatable, right? Um, oftentimes, uh, before I started in prevention, I was an adolescent recovery counselor and, and parents would come up uh, to me and they'd say, this is the fourth time my kid is here. Well, you know, if somebody has cancer, 
and um, we treat them and the cancer comes back, we don't say, well, that's too bad. You had your chance. I'm sorry. No more treatment for you. No, we treat people until they are well. And if it keeps coming back, we continue to treat them until they are well. So, so then addiction defined, right? And I'm sure this, I'm preaching to the choir, you know this, right? But addiction is a primary progressive chronic disease that affects the whole person physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, right? Physically, it changes the chemistry of your brain. And again, for adolescents whose brain is not fully developed, um, that's a huge organ to be changed irrevocably. Um, emotionally, right? Again, it becomes a primary relationship, right? A mom who has... $20 in her hand and her fridge has just mustard and pickles in it and she's got two kids, if she didn't have addiction living in her brain, she would feed her kids. But when addiction lives there, the addiction makes the decision for her. It's not because she's a bad person. <laughs> it's because she has addiction as a disease, right? Um, but it affects the whole family system. And so we see this not only through relationships, but also, again, because of the biological component. And it is a disease that, if left untreated, leads to death. Um, it continues to progress. It doesn't stagnate. It either keeps going until someone is dead or until somebody is in recovery. When we talk about spiritually in this context, right, we're talking about a person's identity, who they believe they are in the world, what they have to contribute to the world, why is it important that they are in the world? And so when I'm talking with adolescents in particular, I, I stress the fact that I'm talking to them. Maybe they've broken the law. That's not really that important to me. I am more concerned that they understand their health matters, their brain matters, their decisions matter. Uh, because we're going to talk about adverse experiences in a little bit, and it's really important to counteract those. Any questions about the understanding of Addiction as a disease. Okay. There is a science to prevention work as well as a passion to it. So this is a basic definition of prevention, right? Focuses on the interventions that occur prior to the onset of a disorder and which are intended to prevent occurrence of the disorder or reduce the risk for the disorder. So a lot of it's education. Ask the question in your family, is there, is there addiction in my family? Is, does somebody have a substance use or process disorder? It's just good information to have. Just like, is there heart disease in my family? Is there diabetes in my family? Are there, you know, is there a cancer in my family? But this bottom one here, prevention is also about optimizing well-being. And this is where faith communities come in, right? Where else should a person be able to experience well-being than in a community of faith? So this is a place where we have an opportunity to really make a difference for a lot of kids that are at risk. So what we have next here is what's called the continuum of care. Um, so I'm a prevention specialist. My, my grant comes to a screeching halt right here, right here at the, <laughs> when it turns into treatment, right? So my work, is in this side of the spectrum. So promotion is just general information to people, right? This is what's going on. This is data that's happening in your community. The universal population is your general population. So we do community education on particular substances. People can log in and they can learn about, uh, they can learn about tobacco. They can learn about alcohol. They can learn about how addiction happens. They can learn about meth or opioids. They can learn about vaping. It's a huge issue right now. So this is just general information. Selective are populations of people that are at higher risk. So for example, people that have experienced traumas, um, populations that have historical trauma, at my jacket here, right, Generation Red Road, which if you don't know about that yet, Google that. Um, it talks about the historical trauma that is present in the very DNA of our Native American brothers and sisters. Um, so it's a selective group. Or when I'm in juvenile detention, those are kids that are in that selective group that are at a higher risk for substance use disorder than other kids. And then we have indicated. Indicated population are kids that are already using. And they may be using to high risk use, but may not yet be 
uh, actually into substance use disordered or disordered use. Um, now, I do have a colleague, Autumn, who's on here. Wave, Autumn. Uh, who's, she, she has a different grant. Her grant is the um, State Opioid Response Grant. And hers actually can go over into this area, which is nice, because part of her grant deals with uh, preventing relapse or pre uh, preventing return to use. Yes. Can't see my cursor. Okay, so the blue part, <laughs> y'all can read, right? <laughs> we'll go with the reading part. Can't see my cursor. So yeah, so my grant comes at a screeching halt at the top. Kind of a bummer. All right, so here's another Mentimeter for you. Let me reload the little bugger here for you. Yes. As soon as I reload it here. <laughs> All right. I think I might have to stop sharing for a second. And slideshows go this way. Then I have to go back to the slides. Okay, get this out of my way. Thank you very much. <laughs> Reload, hello. You all talk to your computers too when you're asking them to do things. <laughs> well, it's going to be persnickety. So maybe what I'll do is I'll just go back and ask the question. All right. So the question that was on that slide that doesn't want to show for me right now is true or false, 60% of those that have a substance use disorder started in their teens. True or false? Raise your hand if you think it's true. Okay, raise your hand if you think it's false. Everybody else, right? It's actually uh, false. It's actually 90% of people that have a substance use disorder started in their teens, 90%. Why? Again, because their brains aren't fully formed and they are more susceptible to that input. So this is why, again, prevention work mainly is working with adolescents. And the reason is about brain health. So oftentimes we'll be talking to parents who will provide alcohol or vaping devices for their kids and they'll say, um, you know, well, at least they're not driving. Well, this is true. However, a basic misunderstanding about brain health. Just because your kid isn't driving impaired does not mean they are at risk. So this is, I like this, uh, <laughs> I like this graph of the brain, right? So memory records events, right? Um, this is you know, your basic breathe and eat kind of function, right? Vision, this sort of thing. But this is the prefrontal cortex. This part of the brain is not fully developed until a person is between 25 and 27 years old. This is the part that has the think ahead part, the uh, learning, the, the second idea, you know, I should maybe think about this one more time part. Um, this is the part that makes a kid reconsider a decision they want to make. And this prefrontal cortex here is kind of when we talk about the adolescent brain, right? The, the gas pedal of the brain, the part that makes kids want to try stuff and explore, the part that makes them students, that makes them curious, makes them wonder, that part of the brain works really, really well. You think of that as the gas pedal. The prefrontal cortex, however, is the brake pedal. It's the part that says that was really fun, but it was a really stupid idea. And for the adolescent, that part of the brain simply doesn't function. And that's not a judgment. So you ask a basic adolescent, how do you know you've had too much to drink? What do you think their number one response is? I puke, exactly, <laughs> I throw up. And I'm thinking, dude, you reached enough a long time ago, <laughs> right? But the idea that that is, that's the idea that I've had enough 
right? It's because their prefrontal cortex didn't say, whoa, I'm getting kind of dizzy. Maybe I should stop. The prefrontal cortex only engages when it becomes uncomfortable for them, right? And by the time a person has gotten to that point, they are definitely impaired and they have caused damage to their brain. And the next time they use, they'll need more to get to that great puking point, right? So this is why the adolescent brain is really important. So that frontal lobe isn't developed. Um, frontal lobe acts as the brake pedal and the age of first use is huge. So this part of the brain that records memory, right? Let's say a kid has their first beer and they fall down the stairs and they break their arm, okay? Will the brain record that as a positive or negative experience? Negative, hopefully, right? I mean, they'll say that was a bad idea. And they may say to themselves, I shouldn't do that again. However, if it was a good experience for them, their brain will record that as a positive experience which is why we have uh, in our line of work we have a you know don't give scratch off tickets to kids you give a scratch off ticket to a kid and they're six years old and they win five bucks that's cool that's recording a positive experience with gambling at a very early age so when we're talking about prevention again we're we're understanding brains how they work how they function and how we can prevent kids right from um adding tolerance to their brain so it's also important to know that mental tolerance um, is different than physical tolerance. So mental tolerance or mental rather mental impairment happens a lot sooner than physical impairment. So if you're driving and you're at a 0 0.08, legally you are impaired, right? Well, your brain became impaired at about 0 0.02 which means that at 0 0.02, your brain stopped telling you to stop drinking. So when we understand mental impairment happens before you even start to feel the effects of it, again, brain health is really important to understand when we're talking about prevention. So here's the science in prevention. Um, hey, Joy. This is, yes. Is um, we're not seeing your slides on our end advancing, just as an FYI. Whoa. <laughs> Let me stop share. Thanks. I just wanted to bring sure. that up before we got too too far advanced. <laughs> Autumn is my colleague, so Hi. We are so <laughs> good with Autumn helping me along here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Right? Her grant gets to go beyond treatment. Yay. I do. I get the <laughs> I get She's the whole of, kit yeah, and caboodle. <laughs> so can you see the SPIF grant now, Autumn? Yeah, I can see the SPIF. Next, excellent. Okay, so this is called the strategic prevention framework. This is the science of prevention. We call it the SPIF model. And so what you can see here in these little flower points, right, are all the parts that go into a systemic prevention work in communities. We understand addiction as a public health issue, right? Therefore, prevention should be a public health concern. So we have assessment. Um, assessment is not only assessing, you know, populations, but assessing people's willingness or interest in addressing the concerns. So where, where Autumn and I live in uh, Western Iowa, we just did a whole survey from, for IDPH, assessing communities' interest in change. Change is hard, we all know this. And there's a scale from one to 10, one being got no clue, 10 mean, meaning communities are embracing it, right? So in all of our communities, they scored a two, which means all of our communities are really in denial or resistance about managing or even addressing youth substance use, which is really frustrating for us in our field. But we have to remember, this is a part of, our, part of what we do. This is how we think in the world. And your basic person on the street doesn't understand that. But assessment helps us see what the communities are willing or interested to do. Capacity, and we're gonna talk about that at the next slide is, well, how the whole community gets involved. Um, planning, so once we figure out what the community is interested in doing, if they're interested in doing, we plan what sort of interventions, prevention interventions work, whether it's simply compliance checks, making sure that people that have, that sell alcohol, make sure they're carting people, make sure that they are actually participating in enforcing 
the regulations, right? Vaping again is a huge issue right now because there's so much misinformation about it. But we can think of that as a, str a strategy. We can think of um, billboards. We can think of media. We can think of simply education of parents. So there's all sorts of strategies. Implementation is actually doing them. Evaluation then is seeing if they're working. So this is the science of what uh, April and I, or sorry, Autumn and I do. But here's where it's really important to understand that nobody has to do this by themselves, right? You've all heard the proverb, it takes a village to raise a child, right? So capacity is this green leaf over here. Capacity is part of how we figure out um, how are we going to maintain uh, prevention strategies so that all of the community is engaged, all of the community um, is capable of participating in it. So does the community have the capacity to continue after the funds end? I'm grant funded. Um, Autumn is grant funded. Any of you guys grant funded? So that is, you know, you guys have a salary, I have a grant, <laughs> right? Which has a finite end and it's that end is varied on either outcomes or whatever, right? So does the community have the resources? Do they have the agencies, right? Do they have time? Do they have space available? How many congregations have um, groups that meet in their facilities, right? So that's an example of space. Communities are willing to engage and share their space for this process. Do they have the personnel? Are there people that are interested in participating in that? Now, where I am, we have people that are trained as prevention specialists. That may not be true in your community. You may just have to kind of explore that and find out. So who then participates in this capacity? Are the slides advancing, Autumn? Yes, they are. Nifty, thank you. So these are the defined capacity sectors, right? So if we're going to be talking about uh, prevention, we should be making sure that youth are participating in this. Uh, where I live, we have something called the uh, governor's or the mayor's youth conference. So they're youth that have identified as people that want to participate in this. Parents, of course, law enforcement, of course, schools, business, media, healthcare professionals, uh, tribal and other governments, faith communities. So you are a part of the capacity model. You don't have to do it yourself. So how do you get involved with this? You find out if there's coalitions in your communities that focus on substance use disorders and focus on prevention. And sit at the table. Be a representative of your faith community and sit at the table so that when people come up with comments and you think to yourself from my perspective as a faith leader maybe this would be an important point for me to make right maybe not all christians use stigma to identify <laughs> substance use disorder and maybe that's an important voice for people to hear at that table maybe you because you have um you know help groups in your in your spaces can offer more space Right? That's another part of being sustainable in the community. You don't have to do it all by yourself. And this is part of the sustainability, um, is that all of these groups work together. I am a part of probably one of the most functional coalitions in Iowa. And we meet, I'm on, on the board of directors, and we meet as a, a coalition, larger coalition group. And we have not only education, but um, we are committed to this as a part of our messaging, as a part of our presence in the community. Um, and I gotta tell you, I am on that, on that coalition as a member of the addiction community. I'm not there as a faith community. It is really hard to get people from faith communities to sit on these coalitions. Whether or not it's because they don't know they exist or because it's maybe out of your venue. But here we have an entire conference on faith and addiction, right? You now know it is a part of your work because if you're sitting in a congregation, you know that roughly about 10% of the people in that congregation are affected by addiction. 
whether it is just they are in recovery, whether they're in active addiction, whether they are uh, children of addicts. So this is where I get to tell a story. Um, so Loyola is up here. Um, before I moved full time to to Rosecrans Jackson Centers, I served a congregation in uh, downtown Sioux City. And on a regular basis, we had a Saturday evening worship and we had a Sunday morning worship. And on a regular basis, the Saturday um, evening worship, we'd have people wandering in from the street, which is great because that's, you know, ministry. And they'd be coming in in various stages of active addiction and various stages of recovery. But there was one woman that came in and I was up in the front reading or something. I don't know. I was on the front. She came in and she was obviously actively using at the moment. And she came in and my dog was always in worship with me. So she'd be laying down um, somewhere around the altar. And the woman came in and she kind of looked around and she saw Loyola. And she went and she sat, she didn't want to sit with the people. She sat in the back corner, right? Trying to be small. And Loyola, as is her want, she got up and she went and sat with this woman. And they sat together. So that woman came back for probably about six weeks. And every time she'd come in, Loyola would go and sit with her. And, and one day, <laughs> one night, I looked up and there she was in front of me with her hand out for communion. I honestly did not ask for her baptism credentials, all right? <laughs> that was not what I was going to do that day. I gave her the body and blood of Jesus. Now, if she had shown up at that congregation and she didn't see a dog sitting there, she might have thought maybe she wasn't welcome. But if we had a dog sitting there, maybe she thought, whoa, these guys may be a little chill, maybe a little more relaxed. And for a long time, Loyola was her church community. Um, you know, she always would slip out, but she began to realize that her presence there did not offend any of us. And at some point she was willing to come forward. In order to help people um, recognize that faith communities have a part to play in these coalitions that are dealing with prevention, maybe you need to stick your neck out a little bit and try something a little radical. <laughs> Try something that will make people that are walking in off the street maybe think that they are welcome to sit there too. That has to be in your own context, but it sure worked for us down there at Emmanuel Lutheran Church. So faith communities have a part to play. So again, sustainability is a big deal with this model. Um, having space available helps for the sustainability. And if faith communities, and it's not, doesn't have to just be Christocentric, right? Um, if faith communities are willing to be a visible part of this, I think that it helps the rest of the community see that, oh man, these are people that we thought had moral char or character flaws or moral failings and churches are stepping up and saying, these are people, human beings that we need to reach out to, which is why Matthew 25 is so important, right? You're imprisoned, you're sick. You're naked, you're thirsty, you're hungry, you're lonely, which are people that are characteristics that can be of a person who has an active addiction and feeling like an outcast. Now, Matthew has another point too, and we'll get to that. The middle part of this SPIF model, again, is sustainability, but also you'll see their cultural competence. Honestly, the only competence I can have about a culture is about my own. So we're starting to change that wording to either cultural humility or cultural curiosity. Um, in a coalition, there should be more than people that look just like you. Different cultures participating. Different cultures have different um, experiences, different stories. We all know this. Um, but in order to be able to activate a systemic prevention strategy, that helps to address all the youth in the community. Cultural competence, recognizing, for example, as a person of faith, the church is responsible for a whole lot of stigma, a whole lot of shame. You all familiar with the doctrine of discovery? 
right? So the doctrine of discovery was written by Pope Alexander just after Columbus bumped into America and then ran home. And it was put in his hand and the doctrine of discovery says, if you land on land and there are inhabitants there, it doesn't say people, but there are inhabitants there, you either can convert them, you can enslave them, or you can kill them and claim the land for the church. So the church is responsible for the doctrine of discovery, which is responsible for the genocide of the native people that live here. And and a while ago up at Standing Rock, I was there with about 500 other people of faith, leaders of faith, and we read the disputation, or sorry, the repudiation of the doctrine of discovery and gave it to the elders at Standing Rock. Uh, and they purified it with fire and said, it's, we apologize. So the church is responsible for stuff. We have to be humble enough to recognize that, to own it. The church, uh, <laughs> slavery was justified by people of faith, right? Um, just in July, nine children came through Sioux City on their way from the school where they died 150 years ago in Pennsylvania back to their home at Rosebud. That was a church that was instituted or a school instituted by the church. We have a lot to atone for. So cultural competence means we have to own that. We have to understand it. What was last week's text, by the way? Anybody remember the gospel last week? <laughs> okay, right? Right? And the Pharisees come up to Jesus and say, is it lawful to divorce your wife and what does jesus say what did moses tell you not god <laughs> what did moses tell you and he said moses said it was okay and he said it was your hardness of heart that made moses even have to do that our hardness of heart is what started institutional schools for native americans our hardness of heart was the doctrine of discovery our hardness of heart was what justified slavery and white supremacy right so um we need to own that and in order to be competent that way we need to recognize our part in injustices so there's two kinds of responsibility there's backwards looking responsibility right assigning responsibility for harmless or harmful events at least being aware of responsibility for events that have happened in our past that have caused trauma historical trauma right born in the dna of people and forward looking responsibility right how then do we rectify this situation so this is how um, Matthew 25 can also be used as a text to help us understand prevention. Being hungry, being naked, being sick, being having a parent imprisoned are risk factors for adolescents. So maybe we can look at that text as let's care for people in order that they have somebody that cares about them forward responsibility. So I'm gonna kind of zip through this. You've had other stigma trainings, right? But there's there's three kinds of stigma. This is actually from one of the um, trainings that Autumn does. You know, structural stigma, there's public stigma, there's self stigma, right? Structural stigma, stigma, right? I'm gonna read it. I hate reading slides, but here we go. Societal level conditions, cultural norms, and institutional practices that constrain the opportunities and well-being for stigmatized populations. Who can give me an example of structural stigma? Excellent, right? Right? The 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 just essentially disproportionate number of people of color in prison, right? And what was, what was red, lining. red lining, right? So structurally, we said, oh, yeah, this land over here can be to all the people that we like, and it has value. This land, not so much. You can't be in here, right? All sorts of that, and that gets woven into our structures. So part of prevention also includes dismantling those structural stigmas. So we need to cross that red line and stand with the people that were blocked out, right? We need to 
recognize and point out the injustices in our incarceration system, right? Public stigma, right? Um, we've had, I think, a bit of an awakening in this nation in the last year or so that, my goodness, there's a lot of negative attitudes uh, when our individual privilege is threatened. Anybody recognize that in the last couple of years? <laughs> Ah, right. Um, so there's a lot of people that are happy to say things that are harmful and say it out loud. And I'm afraid it has become more normalized. I'll just leave it at that. Um, um, self, right. Self stigma. People that have substance use disorder will. You know, people identify. We talked about this yesterday. People identify as an addict. It's a little bit for me, like when I'm talking to people in the LGBTQ community, if they use the word queer, I will use that word with them. They get to decide what they are gonna be called. Um, same thing with pronouns, right? People get to decide how they're gonna be addressed. Um, so if somebody starts to call themselves an addict, I may use that in, in return, but I try to use person first language, a person with a substance use disorder. But self stigma, shame, um, it doesn't really help. So here's my second story. So back when I was um, serving a congregation in Kimbleton, Iowa, I was serving a congregation in a church on the historic registry. I will never ever do that again. Why do you think that is? Uh, right, that A, the church becomes the God, <laughs> the building becomes the God and heaven forbid something happened, right? So I was sitting in my office, in my office, I had I had a, a snake in my office and I had plants and I had toys and stuff in, to invite kids in, right? So I was sitting in my office and these three kids came in and they just, they were looking around at the stuff and they said, do you have anything to eat? And I said, sure. So we went down to the kitchen, we made some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and we had a conversation and then they went on their way. I was very new in this community. And so that evening, um, the, the ladies Bible study came in and I just said, you know, I had these three kids here today and they were hungry. So I fed them and they went on their way. And their first response to me was, well, you know, their father is an alcoholic. And I was, um, <laughs> they were hungry was what I was trying to help with. Right. So that's another good example of structural or institutional stigma, right? Um, did they tell me that so that I wouldn't let them in the building again? So I would recognize they were a risk. So I'd recognize that those kind of people weren't welcome somehow. And this is long before I knew anything about addiction, but I knew they were hungry. You know, feeding the hungry, top 10 thing, right? So um, we have all of these institutions have a lot of stigma attached. Again, unfortunately, communities of faith, <sighs> when we start to think of morality as our main purpose, you know, we've gone off the cliff, right? So stigma occurs at that intersection, right? Where that person believes they are and how the community sees them. Now, I'm glad to say that after a couple of years of being there, those kids and their father were baptized at that church. I, I, I have a feeling that the old ladies that told me that, you know, made sure that I knew that her dad was an alcoholic, don't remember they told me that. But when we can break down those stigmas by action, by visiting the sick, right, the imprisoned, the hungry, um, I think that we have a chance of breaking down the stigmas. These are just some texts that just come to mind, right? So Mark was last week, right, hardness of heart. Um, hardness of heart was the reason that laws that cause harm are written. Somebody says, we need a law to do this. And Jesus says, yeah, just remember that was Moses, not God that did that for you. Um, Matthew 25, we're talking about that again. And Romans um, is about the adolescent brain in a lot of ways. So I'm going to zip through these a little bit. So if you have that yellow sheet in front of you, um, here's where we get to talk about adverse childhood experiences. How am I doing on time? 
Oh, goody, because I talk really fast. I have ADD. Anybody notice that? <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so adverse childhood experiences. So let's just kind of go through these. First, adverse childhood experience. Um, people are now beginning to understand what this looks like, but let's just look at them. So one, and they aren't in any particular order, by the way. There is no hierarchy of these experiences. So the first one is being regularly humiliated, shamed, sworn at, or threatened so you felt afraid of a parent or other household adult. So consider this um, in, in you know, the context of a home where people are supposed to feel safe, supposed to feel loved and cared about, okay. Being physically hurt by a parent or another adult in that household, so hard that you had marks or were injured, okay? Being sexually assaulted by an adult person at least five years older in your household. Feeling that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special. Being hungry, wearing dirty clothes, feeling unprotected because your parents were too drunk or high to take care of you or take you to the doctor if you needed it. Your parents separated or divorced. Witnessing your mother or a stepmother regularly humiliated, physically harmed by her partner with an object hand, a gun or a knife. Living with anyone who was a problem drinker or alcoholic or who used street drugs. A household member depressed or mentally ill or had a household member attempt suicide. And a household member imprisoned. All right, these are the 10 adverse childhood experiences. Um, and when you look at those, it's important again to recognize that um, it changes from generation to generation, from family member to family member. So, you know, if I did these, I probably would come up with my experience. This is before age of 10. So um, I would probably have three of these. However, my son would probably have six of these, right? Um, so it's important to recognize that these are experiences that put somebody at risk for substance use disorder. And the fact is that if a person has four or more of these, they are at a greater risk for substance use disorder or being in the system. And talking to the kids that I'm with in juvenile detention, um, and my husband's the pastor at the penitentiary, we can hold that this is true. That these are experiences that harm a person um, irretro mm -hmm. just irretrievably. So um, when we're talking then about prevention and um, dealing with the, the youth in, in detention or in the alternative schools or wherever I am, um, we don't think, in prevention, we don't say, what did you do? More like, what happened to you? And there is um, someone in California, Gregory Wright. His name is hard to spell. But he's speaking about ACEs now and not even talking about what happened to you, but what is, what is strong in you, which I think is, is really nice, right? These are things that have caused a child harm cause them to diminish themselves. And so he starts talking about ACEs and, and talking about what is strong in you that has helped you survive this, right? So I don't know if this slide's gonna show up. Yay. All right, so go to your mentee if you want to and put in the code 5518-5257. And this is just useful for me. I'm, you know, this is gathering data. Again, nobody knows what your particular input is. And I know that I am dealing with a, a population that probably has a higher instance of substance use disorder. 
Um, so we got fewer than four, four to seven, or greater than seven. Isn't this a fun little app? <laughs> right? And I can do word clouds with it. <laughs> Sometimes people are counting going, oh man. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's 5518-5257. Five, five, one, five, so I can see that six people, seven people. Autumn, are you guys able to access this? Yep, I was able to. Nifty. Isn't that nice that she, I thought, it's so cool. <laughs> We'll figure out some way to get you direct service for this too, Autumn. Awesome, but I don't need direct service for my grant, so. Oh, that's great. You're one of <laughs> you those do. I don't. people. <laughs> <laughs> She's got that grant. All right, so we've got 13 people that have voted. So if you can see, right? We have some people here that have experienced more than seven of those adverse childhood experiences. So what do we do with that, right? Um, first of all, I always tell people, um, those of us in my tradition, we have a cross on our forehead marked in water. Nobody knows it's there except for how you are in the world. It's invisible except for your interactions in the world. So maybe if we use this cross as we move into the world and we interact with people recognizing that people have experiences that we cannot see, and yet people need to be addressed, embraced with compassion, right? Just recognizing that in this small group, we have people that have had seven people are at great risk for substance use disorder, not because of anything they've done, but because of the circumstances in which they grew up. So this is why Matthew 25, right, is very useful in prevention work, right? One of those adverse childhood experiences, right? Not having enough to eat. Another one, um, having people in the home that you didn't trust, a stranger in your home. Not having clean clothes being sick and having nobody to take you to the hospital, to the doctor, having a parent imprisoned. Yes, absolutely. The sad statistic about uh, a child with a parent in prison is that they have a 75% chance of being imprisoned themselves later in life, unless there's an intervention, which a faith community certainly can help. Right. So, you know, instead of looking at Matthew 25, always from the perspective of an adult who is experiencing this, maybe we can start looking at it also as children around us who are experiencing these things as adverse childhood experiences um, and recognizing Jesus in those people, right? So any of these can lead to those aces, right? Jesus identifies with those in the shadows and with those that live in shame. So here's the good news, <laughs> right? Prevention recognizes risk. We recognize, you know, not only does Jesus point us to the results of poverty, illness, loss, and shame, but Jesus also expects us to see those people as though they are he and to interact with them as though it is he in that space. So, so then what do we do? There are resiliencies. So Loyola here, her job <laughs> is to add resiliencies. Yeah, that's you. <laughs> so the very first time 
that I took her the very first day after she was approved to be used at Rosecrans Jackson Center as our therapy dog. I took her to the juvenile detention system. Uh, I'm in there every week in Woodbury County. And there was a kid there who had been there for a long time. Because I'm there every week and he had been there for a long time. I don't care why they're there. I never even ask. Big kid, the kind of kid you would feel maybe um, nervous around um, if you saw him on the street. So walked in the door, first time we all was working, and she walked right up to him and she sat down next to him. And he asked me if he could pet her because they have to ask permission for everything. I said, yes, of course. So he began to pet her. And if you've pet her, you know that you pet her for a while, then she lays down because it's exhausting to sit all the time. So she lays down. So he kept petting her. And then she rolled over and asked him to scratch her tummy. And he looked at me and said, why is she doing that? And I said, because she trusts you. Now, when was the last time that kid heard anybody trusted him? She added a resiliency to that kid right then. And what was also cool was that now he had a special relationship with her. So when somebody came in to JD and they were like, you know, nervous around dogs, he would say, oh man, no, she, you, she's cool. She's all right, <laughs> right? And he could take some ownership and he could be a leader, right? Adding resiliencies to other kids. Um, another thing about Loyola, she's from a shelter. She's a dog somebody didn't want. Okay, now she's going to visit because she hears her, hears her name. Um, <laughs> so she's a dog someone didn't want. And a lot of the kids that I'm with in JD, they have broken relationships, right? Well, maybe it's important for them to get, maybe it wasn't their fault, right? Leola is a good dog. Maybe the fact that she was in the shelter isn't because she was a bad dog. The other thing is recently she had a CT scan because she has a middle ear infection and they discovered in that CT scan, she's full of buckshot. She's been shot. So she's got it in her head. She's got it in her face. She has it in her shoulders. And I, I shared that with the kids in JD <laughs> last week. And they're like, for real? Like, why would anyone shoot her, right? But it's a matter of them having um, a way to relate their own traumas to somebody they care about. Gets them out of themselves. Plus, in juvenile detention, they can't touch each other. There's no touching. And that's a very human need. So she allows them to be touched and to touch in a safe and obviously healthy way. <laughs> and they don't seem to mind being shed upon because she does that. So here are the resiliencies. So these are things that can help kids survive those traumas. So I believed, uh oh, which I knocked over the sign. I believe that my mother loved me when I was little. That's a resiliency, right? I believe that my father loved me when I was little. Now, sometimes, honestly, our father talk regarding God can also be harmful, right? We've had a father who's been abusive, who's been absent, who's, but maybe that father talk who we continually say loves you might be a resiliency for a kid. Um, when I was little, um, there were other people that helped my mother or father take care of me and seemed to love me, huh? How might a faith community participate in this resiliency, right? I have heard that when I was an infant, someone in my family enjoyed playing with me and enjoyed it too. One of the things I did in, in my congregation in, in <laughs> Sioux City was I took out, we had chairs. I took out like the first 12 chairs and I, I moved them out and I put down their carpet and the soft kid toys. I said, this is where your kids should be when they're in church. And if you want to sit down there and play with them, cool. Now, of course, there were people who said, yeah, but my husband donated that chair. It's like, I don't care. A chair's you know, out there now, right? So maybe modeling how to play, right? When I was a child, there were relatives in my family who made me feel better if um, better when I was sad or worried, right? Adding hope. When I was a child, neighbors or my friends or parents seemed to like me. So when kids are in church and there's people glaring at them for being uh, kids, how can a church add resiliency to that? 
get over it, right? <laughs> Let the children come to me. Jesus was quite clear about that. When I was a child, teachers, coaches, youth leaders, or ministers were there to help me, huh? Someone in my family cared about how I was doing in school. The family, neighbors, or friends talked often about making our lives better. Sounds like gospel to me. Uh, we had rules in our home and were expected to keep them. Boundaries are also good, right? Um, when I felt really bad, I could almost always find someone I trusted to talk to. As a youth, people noticed when I was capable and could get things done. I was independent and a go-getter, right? So, you know, I don't know how many of you guys still have acolytes in your, <laughs> in your worship services. Um, I didn't care how old they were. I didn't care if they needed a boost to reach the candles, right? Let them know that they were welcome as they were to do the best they could and that we'd help them, right? Um, I often, I loved having kids give me communion. Boy, did that make them feel, <laughs> feel wow, I can do this. Yeah, you just have to say the words for you. Body and blood of Jesus given and shed for you. That's all you got to do. I, that's all I us do, right? We don't have any special powers. We just say the words, right? So these are resiliencies that we add. And there's a lot of ways that we can do this, a lot of ways that we can help. I believe that life is what you make it, right? You can make it hopeful. You can make it in despair. So resilience building encounters, right? Research suggests that just one caring, safe relationship early in life gives child a much better chance of growing up healthy. It's not that hard, right? It's not that hard. So when, you know, my, the first response to these three kids that were hungry was, well, you know, their father is an alcoholic. Though I might have wanted to smack them just a little bit. <laughs> I said to these women, they were hungry, right? And help them figure out, oh, maybe change the rubric, right? How better are communities of faith, you know, how better can we be situated to be helpful in prevention? So again, Jesus identifies with those in the shadows, those with shame. And Matthew 25 is a great example of that. Um, so addiction can either these examples can actually lead to addiction or addiction can lead to these. Essentially, it's looking out for our neighbors that are in pain. So about 10 minutes. Thank you. So again, Matthew is both proactive and reactive. So this is that Romans text. Now, um, we've talked about Dr. War a couple of times. Would somebody like to read this out loud for me just because it's really hard to read and somebody else can do it? <laughs> Thank you. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the wrong I do not want is what I do. <laughs> Good old Paul, right? Writing, right? Like, what? Okay. One sentence, long words, so like just two. So, so I've always read this as, as Dr. Rohr reads this, right? This sounds a lot like addiction, right? Um, essentially, then our addiction, our sin is our addiction, right? But also, I think of this in terms of the adolescent brain. Remember that prefrontal cortex? I shouldn't do this, but I can't help myself. Right. <laughs> worst, the worst, uh, the worst consequence a kid can, an adolescent can think of is not fitting in. Right. So even though I know I shouldn't do it, I'm going to do it because everybody else is, or I think everybody else is. So this is to me, this kind of great encompassing of not only what leads to addiction, perhaps, but also the results of addiction. So healthy brains are our purpose, our goal, right. In prevention, right? So in other words, right, addiction is a modern name and honest description for what we call sin. And that's from Dr. Richard Rohr in his book, Living, Breathing Underwater, which I think was for sale out there. All right. So I think, and to see if there's anything else interesting here. So again, changing to non-stigmatized language, 
Um, human first language, grace is the mistakes we don't have to pay for. A friend of mine said that. I think that's great. Grace is the mistakes we don't have to pay for. That's great. Um, this is just a little bit of the five C's of positive youth development. The source for this is on the back of that yellow sheet. If you turn that over, there's um, a variety of resources there for you to look at. Um, vaping information, this site here on uh, adolescent development. And the fact is, I don't know many churches that would say, gee, we sure hurt, wish there were no youth here. Anybody say that in their churches? We don't want those pesky youth. But maybe if we first figured out that what youth really need is a, an adult that cares what happens to them, someone that sees the strengths in them, someone that recognizes that maybe the struggle at home is what we can address, we might perhaps <laughs> have more youth interested in what churches do because we become that place. Now, if you saw the, the movie yesterday, The Out of Darkness about the homeboys, it's a home, homeboys, homeboy network, is that what it is? All the traumas that those people experienced before they were incarcerated or, and, and as they were using, those, all those traumas existed beforehand. So wouldn't it be nice if we could recognize that those traumas can be addressed before they turn into an addiction, before they turn into a brain whose normal is now addicted. So they have to live with that. So, um, right, again, just one caring, safe relationship early in childhood can give a kid what they need. And what better mission is there than for people of faith, right? Okay, so questions, thoughts, yes. So when you say early, uh, brain development? Or... Yeah, so that's a good, good. So again, the adolescent brain is not fully developed till 25, 26, 27 years old, right? But there, if people experience those adverse childhood experiences before the age of eight, four of them before the age of eight, they are exponentially more likely to have a, an addiction or in the system. However, that doesn't mean, right, that all those other ages in between, a healthy adult relationship is not a good thing. So, so we can start talking, yeah, about early childhood development, right? Um, systemic places where kids and parents can learn to be together, learn how to play, learn that somebody cares. But all the way up to early 20s, we still can get the brains to be in a place where they are strong and safe before they start to use. Statistically, if we can get adolescents to not try substances until ideally 25, that's not going to happen, but at least till the legal age, and we can help them recognize and, and they can be supported in that choice, they are, <laughs> it's almost a, a non existent choice for them to use later. Because they've already, every time they think they want to use and they remember, oh, wait, somebody I care about, somebody who cares about me is asking me to wait. They're training their brain to make choices that are going to benefit their health, right? Are going to be, and, and they could be leaders in that, right? So um, anytime that we can provide places, one of, one of the prevention strategies we encourage is just alternative activities, right? So places where kids can go and have lots and lots of fun, do lots of fun things, have healthy relationships, that sort of thing without substances, that's a huge strategy, right? That just helps people remember, you can have fun without using. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? Okay.